Each quarter, we celebrate communion as a reminder of the great gift of salvation that Jesus Christ has given to us. We do this to keep fresh in our minds the great gift that God has shared with us through the Christ's death on the cross, but even more than that, the offering of his life in order that we can live like he lived. So this morning, I ask you to ask yourself this one question. How can this communion service celebration impact my life? It is important to remember the historical roots that, from which communion came. Communion, or the Lord's Supper, replaced the original meal called the, fast, the Passover. And from the Passover, we get the understanding of God's message to us and his intentions and his plans for our lives. We are told in the Gospels that Jesus came to the feast and that he sat down to celebrate the feast of Passover with his disciples. And as they did that, he said, he reminded them why they were celebrating it. You see, the text in Ezekiel. 12, 13 tells us that the Passover was named because the angel came and passed over those who had the blood on the doorposts in Egypt. Ezekiel 12, 13 says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you nor destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So when Jesus sat down to this celebration, there was a very specific ritual in the Jewish economy, the way they celebrated it from beginning to end. But in this particular case, Jesus made a profound declaration. He said, and we find it in our text today, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. In this statement, Jesus was saying to his disciples, he was redefining the meaning of Passover. He was asserting a new interpretation, which in effect was saying, I am the Passover lamb. Just as the blood of the original Passover lamb saved the lives of God's people in the old covenant, my blood will save your life. This is a big difference. Those in the early time were protected by the blood on the doorposts and gave them deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But this deliverance was deliverance from the penalty of death and the promise of life eternal. This new focus on Jesus' death and on his life so that he would live is what communion is all about. And as we enter into this communion, we realize it's a very serious situation. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11.26, I'm going to be reading from the message. It helps give some focus to what, I'm going to, what I mean to say here. It says that you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master inadvertently 
is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives, test your heart, come to this meal in holy awe. So this morning, Paul is telling us that to come to this experience of communion, recognizing the great gift that Jesus made for you personally, that he died to pay for your sin, he, he forgave you, and that he lived to offer you his life so that this gift can change your character to be like him. And what Jesus is asking of us is to accept it by faith and let me change your life. That's what Jesus wants for each one of us. He wants us to not take this lightly. He wants us to recommit our lives completely to him. You see, in this covenant, God is the one who's making the promise. He's promised to, to accept us and to change us. We're not making a promise to prove that we're good enough or that we're going to try harder. But our lives are being changed because of what Jesus is, has done for us and what he will do in us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. And Ephesians 2.10 reaffirms it, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ, Jesus, for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in him. God is offering every one of us restoration. And he's the one who's promising to do the work if we let him do it. I think in a way it's kind of like an illustration of this would be like going in for surgery. Imagine if you had to go in for heart surgery. When you submit yourself to the surgeon, you totally rely on the gifts, the, the skill of the surgeon. Nobody lays there and gives the surgeon's directions on what's going to happen. But somehow in our humanity, we kind of have this problem. We understand that Jesus is the great physician. But from time to time, we, we want to say back to him, oh, 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 don't remove that part. I want to hang on to that. Or, or do I really have to give that up? It's, that's just who I am. But Jesus is wanting to clean out our entire being. And he's offering to do it if we give him that chance. In other words, if we really believe that he's a great physician, that he can come in and he can remake us into his image, he can change our hearts, our minds, and our wills because we trust him and we let him do the job. You see, death came on the human race when we were separated from God. What this experience is all about is reconnecting to God. It's letting God in. It's letting him live in our heart. The Passover focused on the lamb first as a sacrifice to pay the blood sacrifice penalty, as it were. But the second thing that all those who participated, they took in and they ate the lamb. They were nurtured by it for the journey that was ahead. And so you and I must be nurtured by the life of Christ. He gives us that life, his life, in order that we can live for him. He was, as the Bible said, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God used the lamb as an illustration of an innocent being taking on the price and giving it its life for another. That illustration holds through to all time. Even the book of Revelation tells us that the Lamb is the one who will gain victory. So just as God's people were delivered out of Egypt, you and I can have Egypt taken from our life the gods of this world, our own selfishness. God can restore us into his image. 
God is looking for a people who will give him the chance to clean up our lives completely. And when we come to this table, we are accepting God's provision and plan. He's promised to do the work. We just need to give him that chance. We need to accept his death on the cross and accept his life within us in order that he can, as it were, dwell within us, in order that he can be our life. He has promised to be with us to the end of the earth. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. He has promised to give us his life so that I am in Christ and he is in me and our lives are different. So this morning, as you come to the table, accept the invitation of Jesus. He says, come unto me and rest. For we enter, when we enter into that rest, we cease from our do-it-yourself labors, and we begin to live by and to trust his work in us and through us, that we can walk with him throughout our lives. May this time of communion this morning be a great blessing for you as you enter fully into all the gifts that Jesus wants to give you. Forgiveness for your past and strength for the present and direction and hope for the future. May God bless you in that experience. Let's sing together hymn number 412, Cover With His Life.